Good morning. It is so good to be here. I'm so excited about it. Share in the last part of your series. It's been, I've been trying to catch up with it online. There were some technical difficulties, but I managed to catch most of it. And can I just say the worship this morning, me and I and the team, it was just amazing. It just blew me away. I thought, yeah. I thought if if I had to get up and preach after a holy night, I might have ugly cried or something all over the, <laughs> all over the stage. Just beautiful. When when you're here all the time, you might get used to it, but when someone like me comes in who hasn't been here for a while and you just sense the presence of God and the anointing in the place and there's something bubbling in the church and there's a, there's a, a buzz in the spirit, there's an energy and I just want to encourage you that you're really going in the right direction. Just keep on doing what you're doing. It's awesome. It's just awesome. I'd like to just quickly pray before we start. I always like to commit the word of God to the Lord, so let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, it has power to touch and change our lives and to touch and change our circumstances. And so, Father, this morning, we open our ears and our eyes and our heart to receive everything that you have for us. Plant it deep into our heart this morning, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it is that time of year where we're busy and we're thinking about Christmas and people, you know, some of you have got your trees up and some have done all your shopping and some haven't even started. We think about the birth of Jesus and it's just really awesome that God would send him. So, of course, the topic is joy to the world. The Lord has come. Oh, yes, he has. And we know it. We know it. And, you know, it's good news It really is good news. When the um, angel appeared to the shepherd in the field, he said, I bring you good tidings, which means good news, of great joy for all people. It's good news. And, you know, we live in a world that if something sounds too good to be true, it generally isn't true. That's the way it is in the world. And we're all a bit cynical out there because somebody might offer a deal or something like that, and we go, mm, too good to be true. It, you know, it's, it's probably a scam. But with Jesus coming to the world and offering us forgiveness for all our sin and offering us the free gift of eternal life, and all we have to do is ask him to come into our life. It sounds too simple. It sounds too good to be true. But the good news is the nearly too good to be true news. That's what it means. It's, uh, but it, it's the only time in your life and my life when something in this world that sounds too good to be true actually is. And it really is. It is good news. So today we're going to go through um, three things. Why Jesus came what it took for him to come, and what it means for us. Now, I could do a series on every heading, so we're just going to breeze through and cherry-pick a few um, scriptures because we're covering a lot of what we would call foundational stuff, things we already know. But, you know, the story of Jesus coming to earth and the gospel doesn't change. And it's good to get a refresher because what it does is it refreshes us. And at this time of year, we're actually very likely to get uh, more opportunities to talk to people about Jesus because the subject will come up. You know, what are you doing for Christmas? Well, I'm going to church and things like that. And so we get an opportunity to talk about the Lord. And so it's good to just go over it quickly so you can give a short answer if you, ha- if you haven't got an opportunity to sit down and say, well, let me tell you, let me go through a 45-minute um, discussion on the gospel of Jesus Christ here. <laughs> and, you know, I believe God, his father's heart was so excited about what was to come. And we see throughout the scriptures where he prophesied And he would start to mention things. And if anybody had an ear to hear, they would realise that a Messiah was coming. A saviour of the world was coming. And you know what it reminds me of? It's like, have you ever bought somebody a present and you're really excited about what you got them? And you are so excited that you want to drop a few hints. You don't want to give it away 
But you want to, I got you something so good. Oh, you're going to love it. It's something you've wanted for a long time or it's your favourite, whatever it is. And, and, and it was the last one left in stock or it was the, you know, it was last one. And I got, and you're busting and you want to tell them but you don't want to give it away. And I, I know it's more serious than that but when I think of the prophecies that God was dropping, <laughs> into man's heart to put into the word of God, I kind of, it reminds me of that, of our heavenly father going, well, Isaiah seven fourteen, just saying, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, some people would have known what that meant. Some wouldn't have had a clue. But he's just saying, mm, just letting you know, you know, if you know how to read the signs and and then in Isaiah 9, 6, and he really starts to call it into existence. And we'll see why this is so important. I mean, he's doing it all the time. Because everything that's created is spoken into existence by God. And we'll dig a little deeper into that. And so he says, for unto us a child is born. Now, he's stating that and calling those things that are not as though they are. Jesus hadn't been born yet when this was written. But God is calling it into being. And so he says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It was like God was sending notifications. You know, he's saying, your delivery has been dispatched. <laughs> your delivery is on its way. It's on board with the courier. <laughs> And your delivery has arrived. And so he was just sending out these things. But if people didn't know how to read the signs or understand what was being said, they could miss it. But those who had a heart to know and listen to the prophets of the day, because he was speaking, the word says, at various times and in various ways through his prophets. And it took a long period of time because God has chosen and committed himself to working through people. So he... He takes his time, and it took a long time to us, to God, a thousand, a thousand years is like a day, or a day is like a thousand years, but to us, it's a long time. And so he would say something, and there'd be a little while, and he'd say something again, but he was speaking, and then when the time was right, and all the prophecies were said, Jesus could come, and it's just amazing. And I just really believe God was so looking forward to having that day where he could have a relationship with his children, us, his family, because his children were estranged from him. The relationship was broken and he was looking forward to the day when he could put the, the, his words on their mind and in their heart. And he was saying, I'll be their God and they'll be my people and their sin I will remember no more. And just awesome. And I, I just know he was looking forward to that time. And so why Jesus had to come, because it's not just a nice story. You know, we have the nativity. You might you think of a, a children's book and, you know, and it seems like it's just a nice story, but it's more than a nice story. We know that. It's, it's huge because man had a problem. We know that man had been created, put on the earth, and then God gave him free will and God swore by that and he will not change that. He gave man free will and man chose basically to rebel against God. And the moment he did that, sin and death and every evil thing entered. And, you know, if you're talking to people out there and, and you might say to somebody, do you believe in God? And they go, no, I don't believe in God. There can't be a God because if there's a God, why is there all this suffering in the world and why are all these horrible things happening and horrible things do happen? But this really is the answer right here because when man rebelled, he made a choice to do it his way and whenever man does it his way, you can be sure it's, without God, it's going to spiral down into some sort of perversion. And so man has his free will, he's done it without God, and then, they might, then a person might say, well, then why, if he's God, if there's a God and if he's God, why doesn't he do something about it? But the thing is that God has sworn by himself 
and he will not contradict his word, his will or his ways, even to his own hurt. And so he has given man free will. He's given us the ability to make decisions because he didn't want a bunch of robots. He wanted people that would love him out of their free will. And it breaks his heart when man says, no, don't want you, and is already under the power of the evil one because we know that Satan is the god of this world, so they're already under that power. And if they turn their back on God and decide just to go where that leads, as we heard just before, it, it breaks God's heart. And so, you know, people might say, oh, well, why does God send people to hell? He doesn't send anybody to hell. He honours their choice. And it's very, very sad and it breaks his heart. And if we understand his heart, and he's not rubbing his hands together with glee and going, serves you right. It doesn't feel like that at all. It breaks his heart. God has set everything by his word. He will not break his word. He does not act randomly outside of his word. And so everything that he's laid out in scripture, that is his will. And he won't go against that. So we've got to be very careful what we listen to, what we believe, um, because sometimes people get discouraged when they're praying and waiting for answers and they think, oh, well, you know, maybe God is doing something else. But God has set out very clearly um, in his word and this is why he sent Jesus to provide everything that we need. I love that, Chris. We're going to hear a bit more about that in a minute. So he has set everything by his word. We know that it got so bad that God had sent a flood and started again in the whole earth. And then after that, he instituted the sacrificial system, the priest system, wherever there was sin, there had to be a death and there had to be the shedding of blood. And so that the law was brought in to show man right from wrong, but there was still a problem because man couldn't keep the law perfectly, just couldn't do it. And even the priests themselves had to atone for their own sin. And it was never completely taken away. And the people didn't have that personal, personal relationship with God that God so, so desired to have with his people. And so he kept you know, sending those prophecies and then Jesus came. And you know, it says in Romans 5, we don't have the scripture, but God demonstrated his love for us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that wonderful? You know, he didn't say you've got to you know, live a good life first or clean yourself up first or if you can attain to a certain level, then I might condescend to give you salvation. But it was just a free gift. We just come as we are. We repent. I remember when I was about... I, when I had gospel preached to me, I really put up a fight. I was hostile. <laughs> I really didn't want... I fought with everything I had. But I remember, Chris, the conviction of sin. And I remember... I was almost through gritted teeth because the, the, the guy who led us to the Lord gave it to us right between the eyes. There was no, there was, there was no soft gospel. And he taught us to pray and to confess and I had to say, I confess that I'm a sinner. Oh, that, my flesh hated that. <laughs> but I confess I'm a sinner and then I receive forgiveness and I ask Jesus into my heart as my Lord and my Saviour. He made it very clear that Jesus is your Lord and you will do what he says. <laughs> but if he hadn't been hard on us like that, I wouldn't be where I am today. I needed, I was a hard case and I needed a hard gospel to let that conviction go, to come in. So Romans 3.23 tells us, and we know this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Before that, it says that righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ is available to all because all have sinned. And so God is making available to us Jesus' righteousness. When we receive Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, we take on his righteousness. Isn't that wonderful? It's not about you or me being perfect. We take on his perfection. He gives it to us. 
It is so good. And Romans 6.23 tells us, for the wages of sin is death, which is what I just mentioned before, but the gift of God is eternal life. The thing with sin is that it's not what we've done. When I was being led to the Lord, um, I remember thinking at one point, I'm not really a bad person. I haven't robbed a bank or killed anybody, so you know I'm not too bad. That's how man thinks. But the problem is that when we are born into this world, when Adam and Eve let sin and death in, everybody who is born is contaminated by that sin. We arrive like that on the planet. And there's nothing that you or I can do to remove that stain, if you like, that corruption, that contamination. We can't get rid of it ourselves. We need Jesus. And so Jesus had to come. And this is why. I just love this. In 1 John, it talks about how Jesus, in the beginning, was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. He, talking about Jesus, was in the beginning with God. All things were created through him and without him, nothing that was made was made. Jesus, that it's, <laughs> this is like to get your mind around this, but Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is the creative power of God. There are many other scriptures that talk about how Jesus, everything was created through him. It doesn't matter whether it was worlds, it says, plural in one, um, powers and dominions. Everything was created through him. Nothing that was made was made without being made through him. So the creative word of God, Jesus, came in the flesh so that he could die in our place and that we could have forgiveness and eternal life. And the thing that gets me the most out of this is that Jesus had to come in the flesh. Let's go back. When Gabriel turned up and said to Mary, you're going to have a son, the word of God was spoken, the creative word of God. The word of God is a seed. You can't have conception without a seed. So the seed is spoken. It goes into Mary and she conceives a child. But the, and the thing is that Jesus then comes in the flesh. And here's the thing. If Jesus didn't come in the flesh, it would have been impossible for him to die. Isn't that amazing? It's he, because could you imagine if they, because Jesus is immortal. He lives forever. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And could you imagine if you took the immortal Jesus and tried to stick him on the cross, it wouldn't have worked. <laughs> they couldn't have killed him at all. I mean, death couldn't hold him anyway, as it was. But do you understand? So he had to come in the flesh so he could die in our place. And what this did, we're going to read that scripture in a minute. Actually, let's read it now. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, one of my faves. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, talking about Jesus, the creator, likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. So not only does he destroy the works of the devil, he destroys the devil um, destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So what happened is when the immortal, creative power of God, the word who was with God in the beginning, came in the flesh, because it says that later down in John 1, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. When he did that, not only did it enable him to die in our place, but it utterly and absolutely destroyed the devil's hold on death and hell and, and over this world. I mean, he's still the God of this world, but you and I and anybody else who hears about Jesus can escape from that corruption and we can receive Jesus because of what Jesus has done. It just broke. The devil, 
he, he would have thought he had it and he had control and he was, you know, directing things where he wanted. But when Jesus came, that was just smashed, completely smashed. And the scripture goes on to say that he came in the flesh and he lived a life of sinless perfection. And, you know, it talks about him being tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. And so now we have a high priest who is eternal, who is merciful, not like they had in the old system where they had different priests and the priests had to, you know, atone for themselves as well as the people. But we've got a high priest and he understands everything that you and I go through because he came down here and lived in the flesh and he felt pain, he felt rejection. He, he understood what we go through. He faced every temptation, yet he was without sin. And he is faithful and he's able to, because of that, he is able to offer himself as a propitiation. That's a big word which just means that he could offer a sacrifice to God that was acceptable and that would avert the wrath and the judgment of God. It's so exciting. Jesus worked, I mean, it's, I find it hard just to put into words and to try and, you know, get it so that we can get it. And I'm, as I've been pressing into this and I've been pressing into certain aspects of the word probably for about 18 months now, and I keep feeling like, got to get it from here to here, and it drops down and then mm, back up, got to get it. And I'm chewing on this word and getting it in there. But it, it is so exciting what Jesus has done for us. And so he knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows what it's like to be suffered. Everything that you go through and I go through and he faces, uh, we face, he has faced and he has overcome it. So the next time you have a problem, it could be an illness, it could be money, it could be a person, don't look at the person next to you, it could be anything, but just... Maybe if you can have that presence of mind in the moment and just say, Jesus has already overcome this for me. Because he said, I have overcome the world. Because sometimes when we're in the middle of something, we don't think like that necessarily. So, you know, that's what it, that was part of um, why he had to come. That's just a very brief outline of why he had to come, what it took for him to come. God had to find the right people. You know, God is very particular when he chooses people for a chosen task. It's no accident. When he chose Mary and Joseph, he knew exactly what he was doing. I've heard some strange things preached about Mary being a frightened little girl or something. Oh, no, she was not. <laughs> you just have to look into the scriptures and know that Mary was, uh, had a healthy fear and knowledge of the Lord. And she knew his, she knew the word of God such as they had at the time. She was well acquainted with his ways and with his works and she was radically committed. Do you know, she was there at the angelic encounter, of course. She was there at the birth, of course. <laughs> she was there at the cross. She was there at the tomb. And the last recording of her whereabouts is in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, getting filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. What a woman! That's, that was the woman that God chose to say she will carry Jesus. You know, he doesn't do anything by accident. And when he picks somebody like you and he puts something on your heart to do something for God, to serve God in some area, to find your purpose, your calling, he, has give, he knows you've got it and he knows you can do it. And he also will empower you to fulfill that. Because sometimes when he calls us, we go, oh, that's a bit big, I don't know. I think I'm you know, punching above my weight or something. But no, God knows exactly what he's doing. Nothing is by chance. God doesn't go, oops, <laughs> it's not in his vocabulary. He doesn't make mistakes. He goes, oh, I made a mistake. <laughs> I've done the wrong thing. I've put this person in charge. It's like, oh, no. No, he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. Joseph was the same. Righteous, sensitive to God. He was obedient. He had four dreams. And he waited on God. They, they were determined to follow the Lord and they carried out their mission and it's awesome. It also took for Jesus to come, overcoming maximum opposition. It was huge. And it's not, when I say this, it's not like you've got God and you've got the devil and, you know, it's like some sort of tug of war. There's actually no contest. 
We know that the scripture tells us in Revelation 12 there was a, uh, a war in heaven and we know what happened there. We sing about it. I saw Satan fall like lightning. They were Jesus' words. He saw it happen. But there was intense opposition because you can imagine the devil and all the powers of darkness wouldn't want the whole cross thing to go ahead. Even if he understood what was going on or not. We don't know. We don't care. But just there, there was just this opposition and it's a biblical pattern and we may come across it at times when we try to birth a ministry, birth a church, you know, do something for God, and we meet with this opposition. Because in Revelation 12, it gives this picture of um, there was a sign in heaven and there was a woman about to give birth and another sign appears and it's a red fiery dragon. And it makes it very clear later on who that person is, gives all the aliases, two of which are Satan and the devil, so we know who it is. And then in verse 4, it says of um, Revelation chapter 12, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. And Revelation says that it was a male child who would rule the nations with a rod of iron. And so what we get is a picture of the kind of opposition that God was dealing with in bringing this to pass. But it wasn't that God was fighting for his life, <laughs> you know, or caught on the back foot or something and finding this too hard. It was just the opposition. And I think the devil must be crazy, you know, to take a bunch of angels to and think, oh, I'll just go against God. I mean, and we see this pattern throughout Scripture when Abraham tried to establish his covenant for the first time, he laid out all the sac animal sacrifice before God. And it says every predator around came to devour that sacrifice. And he had to drive it away. And sometimes you've got to drive away those things that would devour that which is set aside for God. There's, there's, the, it, the enemy just wants to destroy, but he can't. In, when Moses was born, the new Pharaoh was killing off all the children two years old and under, because there were too many of them around. So let's kill them all and throw them in the river. That's the kind of opposition the enemy stirs up. When Jesus was born, what did Herod do? He killed, he ordered all the killing of all the male children, two years and under. And so there's this pattern that we see that when something great is about to be birthed for God, the enemy will try and stop it, but he can't. I love the wisdom of Gamaliel in Acts 5. He goes, they're talking about the new church, and he goes, if this, if this is of men, he said to the, the religious leaders that wanted to go out and kill them and do whatever, he said, if this is of men, it'll just die out. But he said, if, if it's of God, you won't be able to stop it. And I love that because anything that's of God cannot be stopped. And what it also took for Jesus when he came is resurrection power. <laughs> I love this. I love this. And I've only been able to pick a couple of scriptures for the sake of time because there's so much in this. But Paul was praying that the Ephesian church would know in Ephesians 1, 19 and 20 that they would know what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked, some translations say exerted, in Christ, when he raised him from the dead. Now, it's not, again, let me say, it wasn't a contest, it wasn't a tug of war, but what it means is that when God raised Jesus from the dead, there was tremendous power used, and God's got plenty of it, but he used tremendous power, and there's a reason why, but let me just stay on here for a minute. It says, um, Paul wanted the church to know what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, the power of God toward us and in us when we receive Jesus is resurrection power. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us. When you become born again, your spirit becomes perfect. Born alive, born again. We look at the body and we've got, you know, whatever aches and pains. That needs to be healed. This needs to be renewed. This, this is what blocks us. It's, it's our mind. It has to be renewed. But his mighty power, which he exerted, why did he use so much power? Because when Jesus went to the cross, we know he carried the weight 
of the sin of the world on him. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment for our peace was laid upon him and by his stripes we are healed. And so this weight, and we saw a glimpse of it in the Garden of Gethsemane because the stress of what was descending upon him, the burden of, you know, anybody who's an intercessor knows what an intercessory burden is, but this would have been a million times worse. And it caused his sweat to turn into like great drops of blood. And his disciples, I believe, they couldn't stay awake because it was so oppressive. If you've ever been under any oppression, you know it just makes you want to sleep. And so as he struggled with this and then he took it to the cross, he took, and it's past sin, present sin and future sin. And so he, you know, he, he, was, he was stressing because he was in his flesh and his flesh was feeling it and his flesh wasn't wanting to do it. Can you imagine? We know what it's like when our flesh doesn't want to do something. You've got to forgive that person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we know what our flesh is capable of. And so he was feeling that. And so we get that, that, that glimpse. But the thing is that Jesus did it. We, of course he did. That's why we're here today. He did it. And Hebrews 12 says, because of the joy that was set before him, he could endure the cross and despise the same. He was looking forward to when you and I would say, yes, I will receive Jesus as my Lord and Saviour. Yes, I will receive forgiveness for my sin. Yes, I will receive the free gift of eternal life. And he was looking for, to all the people who were going to take part in that. And we were going to become like him and have a relationship with God, a personal relationship with God where we all know the Lord. We instinctively know it's just wonderful. And he knew the day was coming when he would stand in revelation in his resurrected glory. I haven't got the scripture up, but if I had a favorite scripture, this has to be it. Revelation chapter 1, the end of verse 17 and 18, where he says, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am alive. I was dead. But behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and I have the keys to death and hell. And so that's the resurrected Jesus. And so what it means for us? Firstly, it means anybody can receive it. It's for everybody. Jesus died for the whole world. We know John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him but would not perish but have our everlasting life. He sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but through him the world might be saved. And that's God's heart and it's for everybody, any whosoever. And I have seen some time, you know, both my parents, I, I had the um, opportunity to bring them to the Lord. My mum resisted for 40 years. I've been a Christian nearly 45 years, my, and she was the main persecutor of my faith. And I haven't got time to go into the story, but I was able to lead her to the Lord a few years ago. And my dad, he, put, he fought it for 25 years. So I want to encourage you, if you've got a long-standing family member, God gives them time to repent because he has made it available for everybody. It's there for anybody. Is the whole world saved? No. But Jesus died for everybody and everybody can have it. So what does it mean for us? When we receive Jesus, we move location. Colossians 1, 13 and 14 says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness. I love this. You get a lot of scriptures where the tense is passed because it's done. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. I made a very shocking discovery when I was looking at the scripture. I thought, I wonder if I could find a, a translation that maybe puts it into slightly easier language. I looked up about four. All of them, I won't name them, all of them left out the blood of Jesus. I, I thought, oh, so just have a, have a look at the version you've got on your phone or wherever and check it out. So... 
I was really shocked. I'm like, oh, so this is all New King James today. So if it's a little bit wordy, that's why I'm just sticking with it at the moment. So I'll read that again. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love, whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He has equipped us as well. Pastor Chris said this morning, he has given us everything that we need. He has. We don't feel like it, but that's our feelings. But this is the word. 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4 says, his divine power has given to us all things. You already have it. You already have what you need that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. Ephesians 1, 3 says that he has given us every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. It's not that, um, see, when Jesus died, he took our sin, he gave us eternal life, but he also provided an inheritance for us. And so we have everything available to us that we need to get through this life. He has made it. You have it now. You have it now. We have his promises. We we partake of his divine nature. We have a relationship with him. He intercedes for us. And now our job is to represent him to the world because we've been reconciled to God. So now we have the ministry of reconciliation. If you're sitting there thinking, I don't know what my ministry is, you have a ministry of reconciliation, of bringing people into the kingdom of God. We're the light of the world, the salt of the earth. We are his ambassadors. We have his authority. We have full use of his name. Everything that Jesus has, we have. 1 John 4, 17 says, that we don't that love has been perfected in us and we don't need to fear the day of wrath because as he is Jesus as he is so are we in this world not when we get to heaven not when i get my act together but as he is so are we in this world that's the real truth that's what we are on the inside and do you know you have you smell good? Because <laughs> in 2 Corinthians it talks about we are the fragrance of Christ wherever we go. <laughs> and we don't like you don't think about ourselves like that, but do you know what it says? It says we are the fragrance of Christ to God. And then we are the fragrance um, of Christ to those who are being saved and the fragrance of Christ to those who are perishing. And so to one it's the smell of life and to the other is the smell of death but we have an aroma we have a fragrance so what that means is everywhere you go when you walk in somewhere you change the atmosphere whether you realize or not it's like we wear some you know people might not realize that somebody might come up to you and say there's something about you you know there's just something about you and they don't know what it is they don't they don't even know what they've they've picked up on they might call it a vibe or something like that but it's the fragrance of Christ that travels with us so to finish off it really is joy to the world the lord has come hallelujah good tidings great joy eternal life is available to all and if there is anybody sitting here and you haven't received Jesus as your lord and savior I would encourage you to do it today. It's the best decision you'll ever make. And, you know, and don't put it off because seriously, you might think, oh, I'll do it later, but you don't know what's going to happen out there. We hear of awful things happening every day and people die before their time. Don't, don't, don't waste it. This is the day. So, and I will say this, there is an eternity waiting for everybody, but where you spend it, is dependent on the decision that you make. We know where we're all going. If life finished right now, we know where we would be. And that's a great thing to know. So you can have a relationship with Jesus. You can have forgiveness. You can receive healing. You can receive an answer to a problem because joy to the world, the Lord has come. Amen. Let's stand and pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we praise you and we thank you. 
we sang these worship songs this morning and Lord we mean everything that we sang this morning you are so worthy and we are so grateful we thank you for Jesus we thank you that you sent him and he came and he lived in a body like us and he died in our place and he shed his blood so that we could have the forgiveness of sin. Lord, we praise you and we thank you. Words just aren't enough to say how thankful we are. And it is so good to get together with others and all gather together and agree together that you are so good. And I'm going to ask if there, if there is anybody here and you have not given your heart to the Lord and invited Jesus to come and you have not received salvation. In other words, if you were to die today, do you know where you would go? And you would like to make that decision today. I would just invite you to just raise your hand just to let me know and I'd like to pray with you. Is there anybody, I mean, I'm aware that we're probably all church people, but if there's anybody and you haven't made a decision for Jesus, he's waiting for you right now and his arms are open. And I'm just asking, if you'd like to just raise your hand and let me know and say, yes, I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Saviour today. Receive forgiveness of my sins and the free gift of eternal life. I'm trusting that everybody has already made that decision, but if you haven't and it's a bit scary, come and see me later. We can we can get that sorted today. God is so good. I'd like to encourage you as we heard this morning that Jesus has given us everything that we need, and if there's something that you need to see manifest in your life. You need to see something come to pass in your life, whether it's healing, it could be finance, a relationship, anything. You have a need. I don't want anybody leaving today with that that has a need and needs prayer to walk out the door without that happening. So if you have a need today that you would love to bring before the Lord and have agreement in prayer, then I ask you to come forward as the band sings this final song. And we'll pray with you and we'll believe God because Jesus has done it all. He's overcome it all. It's an easy thing now for, for us to see it happen in your life. So please come forward if you have a need for prayer and these guys will lead us in some more worship. You 